Now we'll have all of the panelists join me um, and we'll address the, the questions that we see. Um, let me just at, at, at the top say that if we don't get to your question, we will uh, answer it and post it online. Uh, there are a number of questions in here. But to start things off, um, people have voted this one to the top. So let me start there. And I think I'll address this one to Charlie. Charlie, um, the question is, how, how can materials developers uh, become away, aware of key materials problems to solve in the field? Uh, we have capabilities, but we may not be sure how or even whether it makes sense uh, to engage. And that, to me, sounds a bit like a coordination question. So, so let me throw that one to you to start. Well, <clears throat> I assume you're talking about you know, people who, who do materials for a living, uh, optimized materials. So this is something we've been talking about for a long time, you know, how to close the cycle between uh, quantum experimentalists, you know, design and material science, you know, to make the devices better. And I don't think there's one <clears throat> magic way, but I think the, the way to do it that's probably the best is to have a tight feedback loop with between those three things, you know, so it's not, while it may be interesting, it's not so useful to go off and design materials on your own, because if you don't test them quite quickly in the qubit or quantum sensor environment, you don't know if they're really having any effect. You know, and we see, you know, in my other job, I do research and we see this all the time. You can take a, uh, a, a, a fib image of a material, it looks perfect, but when you make the qubit, it's garbage. So, I mean, you really need that tight feedback loop and get the scientists and the material scientists working together on the same team. Great, thank you. Um, another question that's risen to the top, maybe I'll start this one with Eric. Um, what are the main pros and cons of each flavor of quantum computing technology? Um, Google has started with superconducting qubits, but of course, as we saw in, the, um, in my own talk, there's ions, neutral atoms, and others. Um, what do you think are, are the trade-offs and, and maybe why did Google go with superconducting qubits? Thanks, Will. It's, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think that there's, it's ex an exciting time for a number of architectures. And in this NISC era, you can see a lot of the advantages for, say, the different types of architectures that are out there. Um, take ion traps, for example, which you have this ability to do a little bit higher coupling between the qubits. Um, in superconducting qubits, we have decided on really a 2D planar grid. So we're working at this nearest neighbor interaction. And we chose that for a couple reasons. Uh, early on, even back at UCSB, before it was acquired by Google, we started to look at this code, which is the error correcting code that we would like to use in, on our way to build an error corrected quantum computer. And that naturally lays out on a 2D grid. Um, so that nearest neighbor interaction is what we've been building to show, even in the NISC era, when we have these noisy systems, that we could use that to be forward compatible with our kind of long-term vision of an error corrected quantum computer. Yeah, you know, what really excites me also about that answer is that it, it emphasizes that this is becoming a system and there's system trade space that we need to think about. It's not just picking the best necessarily, you know, qubit du jour, but you have to think globally in terms of a system and how you're gonna define it, how you're gonna engineer it. Um, which leads to another question, I think, um, let me ask this one to Christopher. Um, what is the advantage of quantum simulation uh, versus general purpose computers? Um, and do you think there's a space for hybrid simulation, you know, uh, general purpose computers working together? Sure. Um, I think that there is, uh, you know, in any type of computation, um, there, there are, uh, Niche, application, niche applications. For example, let's think about the classical systems like uh, anti-lock brake systems, right? Um, you don't use a general purpose computer to do your anti-lock brake systems. You need something quick that's just really, really good at that, right? And so, I, and, and you don't need all of the CPU that can do anything, that can do your Excel spreadsheets or your, you know, uh, video system, your Zooms and, and everything, everything that's possible under the sun. And so um, in, the, in these early days, when we're trying to get all of the juice out of um, these very early computers where the qubit numbers are low, the noise is relatively high, and there's a limitation of what you can do, there may indeed be some real use for these niche type of applications where if we just concentrate on doing something like the quantum equivalent of anti-lock breaks, right? Uh, some specific calculation that we could use 
uh, a special purpose computer that just does that. If you think about it as an ASIC or, or, or an FPGA that just does some one task really, really well. Um, you could probably do that and be better than a classical computer with a uh, modest number of qubits compared to what you would need to do error correction and the things that Eric was talking about, uh, where you need to do anything well, right? Um, and, and in that case, uh, one of the areas is simulation where you may not have to convert everything to ones and zeros. You could actually do things. We have analog computers in classical computing as well. We still have them in our cell phones and they do something really useful, uh, which is allow us to talk on the phone. Um, RF machines are, are still there. Um, uh, so in the same sense, there is an analog variant, if you will, of quantum computers that can do this kind of simulation. And there, you wouldn't really even call it a computer, it's more of a solver. Um, but uh, it's, very, it's relatively simple to put a wave function, which is what we're looking at, into terms of, into a qubit, and because the qubits actually uh, form a wave function. Uh, so we can actually put that wave onto a qubit rather simply, uh, kind of as a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, or you know, oversimplifying it um, thing. So um, in that sense, you can do those kind of calculations, and I use that word very liberally, um, using simulations on these smaller qubit number things if you don't have to worry about turning everything into zeros and ones and calculating things. Um, so I think there will maybe be a role for getting an advantage out of using these qubits as analog systems, even in this noisy regime in the relatively short term. I see, yeah, so almost as a co-processor with a classical computer that's orchestrating or controlling the, the quantum algorithm. Right. right. Liz, um, quantum computing is a very exciting field, and, um, but we're still very early in the technology development cycle. And, and Keysight has jumped in, right? And I, I guess what I'd like to ask you is how does Keysight think about the potential for reward versus risks of these quantum technologies because it's such a new field? And related to that, what do you see as the opportunities um, and challenges and you know, what advice would you give to, to others who are thinking about entering? Sure, sure. Well, one of the things that's been interesting to us with the uh, quantum research given the whole COVID situation is that, like you said, if you're, uh, if you're in it, you've got to be in it to play and that's not a short-term investment. Um, so we've seen from a, I'd say business stability from my business standpoint, um, very little impact to our order stream uh, with respect to, to quantum investment, which has been great. Um, but I'd say for us, it's touching hundreds of customers right now that are operating in a one or two qubit regime, right? And it's only uh, very few, uh, like Eric and the team at Google here that have gotten up uh, north of, of 50 qubits. So um, for us, it's a widespread research effort. And uh, I'd say there's a lot of customer opportunity. As this thing scales, you ask about return on investment over the next five to 10 years. Um, certainly, the industry leaders are looking to double um, their number of qubits or their quantum volume each year. And uh, as that happens, I think the complexity also goes up exponentially. So we hope to be there with both software solutions uh, and hardware solutions to, uh, to help those customers solve those problems. And maybe someday become embedded in the computer itself. We'll see. Okay, that's a fantastic vision. Um, Eric, would you, would you like to answer the same question? I mean, it's an exciting field and Google's jumped in. Um, <laughs> What do you think about the opportunities and challenges? Yeah, I think it is an exciting time. I mean, we're looking at, you know, rolling out, uh, you know, I think as Liz was talking about, it's always nice to think about growing these systems um, and, you know, being able to start to lay down the milestones as we plan to grow to an error corrected quantum computer. And along that way, each of these kind of new, say new processor that we have to develop I like to think about what it kind of unlocks for humanity. And I really love this NISC era for that reason too. We got to think about, we have some new tool that has never existed before. There are calculations that we can perform on Sycamore that can't be done on any other machine today. And as we keep growing that system to think about what algorithms we might be actually able to fit into that kind of quantum computational volume, right? That's really exciting. And that's even before we get to the error corrected quantum computer. And I would like to encourage everyone to also think about what algorithms we can do when we get there. But of course, there's this intermediate time that's really exciting. Um, 
Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Um, related to that, uh, exciting technologies, um, Charlie, um, exciting technologies, okay, they're exciting, right? And um, of course, it's very natural, not just in quantum computing, but in AI and elsewhere. Um, this can lead to an over exuberance, a hype cycle. Um, and of course, that can also lead to a valley, right? And so, um, in your opinion, is there too much hype today in quantum computing? And, and if so, um, what can we do to manage the hype? And what can the government do to help us manage the hype? Um, that's a hard question to answer. You know, uh, you and I have been in this field for 20 years or so, and I think we've gone through a few of those wave, you know, waves and troughs. This is probably the biggest, so that's a good sign. They keep, they keep getting bigger and bigger. Um, you know, from my perspective, you know, there's a couple of things we definitely don't want to happen. We don't want to expand the research so fast that uh, there are no jobs for people. Like if there's all these people coming out of school and there's no jobs, it just hurts the field. We don't, you don't, you don't want these big up and down swings of funding uh, that can really damage the field. Uh, you want to ensure that the critical investments we do make are not lost during, you know, up up and down cycles, right? Because there's a lot of IP and a lot of uh, a lot of real value that's being created right now. So software, hardware, everything. How do we preserve those through inevitable ups and downs, right? So. I, I don't know um, if we've gone overboard or not. I mean, I tried just to keep, you know, we, we, we very intentionally start with science first approach because, you know, there's, we need to make it clear to people and honest that there are questions here that need to be solved. We need to find the application. There's a lot of promise to this technology, but it's, there's, there, we're not, there's a lot of work to do. And just as, as long as we're keeping clear and honest, I think the right investors will come. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, as I mentioned in my talk, and thank you for bringing it up again, um, you know, it's it, sometimes people will say, you know, it's just engineering, right? Which, of course, as an engineer myself, <laughs> it makes me shudder. Um, but quantum engineering, uh, when I say quantum engineering, I mean both science and engineering. Um, we have to continue the science because, as you said, there's so many unanswered questions we still need to answer. But I think it is time to start stepping up the engineering side to start bringing these technologies to to practice. Can I jump in on that too, Will? Oh yes, yeah, please go ahead, Eric. Yeah, I, I wanted to thank Charlie and all the effort that's going on at the U.S. government to actually help with that bridge. I think that's a huge win that we've seen just in the past couple of years with the National Quantum Initiative. Um, very excited for your leadership there, Charlie. I think this like this bridging that valley has this. Uh, you know, big potential for a lot of the academics and the across the industry to start to grow the talent is one thing. And I think continuing to show this, like lead with the science first is what we all need to be doing. You know, try to avoid this, like, you know, PR campaigns and to say really like, what is the scientific achievement that we've done? Let the community, you know, feed on that and think about it and, and criticize it. And then we can course correct and make the next uh, achievement together. But I think that helps when you've got this ability across, say, the U.S., in this case, to really help all the, the academic groups as well to participate with, with funding that's coming from the U.S. government. So I just want to say thanks as well. This is really great. Yeah. Let me also thank you, Charlie. It's <laughs> <laughs> not just me. To thank, the, thank the agencies. They're the ones who implement the programs. I mean, that, that's really what happens in the, in the U.S. Yeah. Um, so maybe jumping back to Liz quickly, the um, the related to this this hype cycle. I mean, the the of course many of these technologies that we're building in support of quantum computing have dual use capabilities, and in fact, by addressing the quantum need, may actually advance other needs that exist that are not in quantum computing. And I wonder if you have seen that or expect to see that. Uh, at Keysight in the products that you were making? Oh, ac actually, excellent question. Yeah, so I mentioned the acquisition of Signadyne uh, several years ago in the, the quantum space due to some of their, uh, their hard virtual instrumentation technology. Uh, that was something that we picked up for quantum, but we also realized could be applicable in a lot of marketplaces, right, where you need very um, 
time de deterministic control, right, and triggering across different uh, different architectures. So that could be used in aerospace defense. That could be used in wireless communications, um, and in quantum. So that's something that we're looking to to uh, deploy a bit more broadly in our in our solutions. Absolutely. Great. Yeah, and I was going to ask you, Christopher, the same question. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things we deal with in, in algorithms development is particularly in this NISC era, which noise is the end, right, um, is that we have to typify noise. We have to identify the noise. We have to understand that noise. And the flip side of that is uh, the, the noise is environmental noise. And if you can detect and typify environmental noise, well, what do you have? You have a sensor. And uh, so uh, the flip side of being able to do this in software, and so there's this really an iterative thing that can happen here. Um, where, yes, it's dual use, but dual use in, in a couple of different ways. Yes, military dual use, but also uh, use as a sensor, but also use in, um, in software and computation. So the developments that we're making scientifically and engineering wise on controlling these systems and typifying these systems in order to do computation um, also have ancillary effects and, and capabilities uh, that are directly applicable to some of those types of technologies in, in networking and sensing and, and these other areas. So what we do in computers to make them better is actually going to make the sensors better. And in some ways, maybe even more near term applicable in, in, in commercial systems. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Charlie, a question came up specifically oriented to you. It, it, it asks you, what are the programs available to early stage startups uh, in quantum software space uh, that can leverage things like the National uh, Quantum Initiative Act? Well, uh, it depends on the agency. So, you know, there, there are many different agencies who actually implement uh, for the quantum information science funding across the government. It's one of, it's one of the great reasons our model works so well is that different agencies have different missions. Um, so I would, there are examples like, um, SBB, SBIRs, small business uh, different engagements. So I would look at the agencies that are funding quantum, you know, DARPA, ARO, uh, the various DOD labs, DOE, NSF. NSF in particular has some new um, quantum accelerator uh, programs starting up next year or, or imminently. And they have many different programs at all different levels. So I, I would look at the agencies and there's various websites, you know, you can find that gives you, shows you those opportunities. Great. I think we're getting towards the end um, of the panel discussion, but let me just ask uh, one last question to each of you um, and feel free to answer that or to, you know, pivot and answer, you know, and give some advice. Um, but, but the general question that I've seen here is, you know, what, what are the key things that are going to um, make quantum computing usable for business? And um, are there types of problems that are going to benefit us most in the nearer term? And I guess that could be quantum computing, it could be also other technologies. And um, uh, let me start, I guess, with Chris, Christopher. Yeah, I mean, we, we interact with uh, a bunch of Fortune 100 uh, companies. Uh, we partner with them to, to, to develop various algorithms. I think uh, we're, we're, we're arriving at um, uh, at least an initial conclusion that some of the, some of the really early uh, applications uh, will be in um, quantum machine learning. So uh, machine learning as an aug augmentative uh, technology to classical machine learning that we're doing now. Uh, and, you know, early indications are that with a relatively modest uh, number of qubits, we may be able to get um, some uh, results that are better than uh, what we can do with classical computing. And when I, when I say better, I don't necessarily mean just faster. If you can uh, learn something better, learn, so we use deep learning to learn a, a model. So what does a cancer cell look like versus a normal cell? or a cancerous MRI scan versus a non-cancerous MRI. So if I can teach my computer better what that looks like by using some of the probability distributions that we have available to us on a quantum computer that are really, really difficult to use to sample data over um, on, a, on a classical machine. Um, if that takes an extra month, but I can find uh, cancer 5% more times, I think most patients, most doctors would say, okay, yeah, let's take the time to do that, uh, to teach our model better. And, and, and the folks at Google will tell you, some of these models that we use uh, in machine learning take a month to train anyway. Uh, so it's not necessarily being just faster, which is a lot of what we think about here. 
it's it's being better, qualitatively better, and and we are are, are reaching a, a, an early uh, conclusion scientifically based on empirical evidence that we're seeing that um, we may be able to get better models uh, using uh, these quantum technologies, the quantum computation technologies in machine learning, and we're really excited about that, and we think that that will have industrial use pretty horizontally. Everyone's using machine learning now. If you are using deep learning now, and particularly things like GANs. Uh, uh, generative adversarial networks, you're probably going to find an advantage here um, in relatively short order. I don't mean tomorrow, I don't mean next week, but in in, in an order where it should be on maybe your business plan and, and your workforce development plan. Eric, uh, same question, maybe in one minute. Sure. Yeah, so you talked about maybe some of the opportunities, uh, you know, for, for business here. One thing I would make the recommendation is to to hire for quantum. That may be physicists, yes, and it's also engineers. Um, I think building a team so you have some quantum native uh, on the team to start to build out. And it'd be great to start working with, with Chris's team. Our team is an example. I mean, Keysight's an example, but all of these are great opportunities for the businesses that are today starting to think about quantum to get some more quantum native in their, in, in their talent and, 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 and really grow this now. Um, and I would, I would just like to echo what Chris was saying. I mean, we're really excited about, uh, you know, quantum machine learning. Um, I think that's a great opportunity in the NISC era. And I love this idea of thinking about quantum computing and quantum processors today as this coprocessor that you talked a little bit about, Will, like where we can start to think about maybe offloading a little bit of that learning off to the quantum processor part that may give us this better answer, may find that lower valley, the actual global optimum to a problem that we just couldn't solve earlier. That's a, great. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. yeah. Liz, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share uh, with our attendees today? Yeah, I think in the application space, we have to be careful on the hype of quantum is everything for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. Keysight, actually, our view is that we see quantum coming into play in simulation environments first uh, for things like materials research or uh, pharmaceutical research or chemicals. Um, and maybe the more AI driven things for financial and automotive follow that, right? So I think phasing the technology over time is really important. And um, stating over and over, right, that classical computers and quantum computers will live together for some time. And most likely those quantum computers are going to live in the cloud um, to start. I think that helps kind of frame for people what the use case is. They're not going to be buying one for next Christmas. So <laughs> not, not yet anyway. <laughs> we can wish for it, I guess. <laughs> Charlie, uh, final thoughts. Uh, I guess what I would say is, you know, this is going to be a, this is this has been and it will continue to be a, a long term endeavor. And industry, in addition to the government, should be trying to inspire the next generation and train the next generation. So make you know, spe especially companies who have significant investments in this, should be committing over the next five, ten years to providing materials to train that those next generation of scientists and that's very important and we're going to be working on that as well in the next few months well with that i think we're at the end of the hour let me again thank uh, charlie liz eric and christopher for joining our panel and your presentations today i really appreciate you taking the time and also appreciate all of the attendees who took time out of your very busy schedule to join us today and with that i'd like to hand it back to home great Thank you, Will, and thanks to all the speakers today. Thank you for your great presentations and insightful sharing. And thanks to you, our audience, for your participation today. And uh, as I mentioned, this uh, webinar is recorded and will be posted on our website in a week or so. Now, before we sign off, I do would like to you know that tomorrow, Wednesday at 9 a.m. Eastern time, we will have a webinar which uh, will have presentations from a dozen MIT connected startups in the area of robotics, material, energy, healthcare, and blockchain. So if that sounds interesting to you, please don't miss it. And then next Wednesday, we'll have a webinar related to gene therapeutics and vaccines, another very relevant topic at this moment of time and you can find details of agenda and the registration links at our website, again, ilp.mit.edu. Thanks again for your participation today. 
And on behalf of MIT Industry Liaison Program, I wish you and your family safety, health, and all the best. Goodbye now. <laughs>